on the model improvement feature engineering data processing so in this class we're going to be learning some of the important concepts that are needed for modern data science and machine learning because it has a major influence on the performance of your models and the quality of insights you can get during EDA exploration data analysis and the rest so in this workshop or in this uh, online class I'm going to show you some important techniques some tools and to probably extract to prepare and to engineer features from your data sets. Okay, so my name is Faisal Nodewa. I'm a data scientist and researcher at Data Science Nigeria. So, yeah, I basically carry out research into products and development um, cut using cutting edge tools in the feed, data science feed, and AI feed. The rest, okay. So, um, what will you learn in this workshop? So in this workshop, we're going to be learning what feature engineering is, how to handle missing values in your data, how to handle categorical features, how to handle numerical and continuous features, creating preliminary features, normalization of features, working with date and time, and uh, I think this should be number eight. Yeah, number eight. Working with latitude and longitude. Okay, so these are just like some of the um, important tips or things that you can do in order to process your data and uh, help to improve your model. So there are many other things that you can actually do as well, but these are just like some of the important things that you will need to do if you are working with data, okay? So um, first of all, let's start by defining what feature engineering is, okay? So feature engineering is a process of using domain knowledge of the data to create features to make machine learning algorithm works Okay, so for instance, if you are working with a financial data set, for example, and uh, you can use uh, details or features such as uh, the date the loan was collected, uh, the amounts that was collected, and you can derive features from this. For example, you can combine the features in such a way that you can get the interest that was, that, um, um, so how would I put this? So you can get the interest that the loan has accrued over time by using the time, the uh, principal, and the rate at which the loan was given. So if you are working with uh, transportation data, for example, you can use distance. If there's a distance feature, you can use distance. You can use time, maybe time of arrival or something like that. You can use it to calculate, say, speed, for example. So basically what you are doing is you are using an understanding or a domain knowledge of the data to be able to create new features for example and to also better understand and process your features so feature engineering is actually a wide it's a wide area and it's very very important as well so besides using domain knowledge as you can also uh, process you can also do data pre-processing that means you try to convert your features into a different format that is suitable for machine learning models because uh, machine learning models can only work with numerical features. Okay, so if you have categorical features in your data set, you have to look for a way. There has to be a way of converting these categorical features into numerical features. And also, there are some kind of numerical features that you are going to have. Maybe they might be at different scales. For example, you might have um, income, which can be in the thousands, tens of thousands scale. And you might have, uh, uh, for example, let me say, uh, month, month in a year, which runs from between one to twelve. So you can see, month in a year has a range of one between one and twelve, while um, income has a range in tens of thousands. So you can see these two, though they are numerical features and they can be used by a machine learning model, they are at different scales. So there are ways in which you can bring together or try to compress these features so that they can have the same skills 
So we will talk about those things, those are standardization, normalization, and the rest. So there are many other things that we will talk about in this course. So why is, is fusion engineering, why is it important? Okay, so fusion engineering, according to some top experts in the field, and uh, if you actually have been doing data science for a while, you know that um, doing good fusion engineering can actually improve your model a lot, okay? So here's a, uh, a, 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 an advice from Pedro Domingos, the author of a few useful things to know about machine learning. He said, so machine learning projects succeed and some fail. What makes the difference? So easily the most important factor is the features that are used, okay? Because if you collect data and um, you can't use all the features, so knowing which feature to use can actually help to improve your models because uh, for example I've worked on a project whereby removing some particular features actually improved my model and it was not the other way around okay so so being able to analyze your data sets look at your features and know which particular ones are useful which one are not useful which one needs to be transformed is actually a very important skill that you must have as a data scientist or as a machine learning engineer so here's also another one from Andrew Eng Engie. He said, coming up with features is difficult, time consuming, and requires expert knowledge. So, but applied machine learning is basically feature engineering. Yeah, for you to use uh, machine learning in the real world, you have to do lots and lots of data processing and lots and lots of feature engineering. Okay, so um, let's move on. Now, for us to understand feature engineering and perform some different, different uh, techniques on it, we have we need to have our data sets okay so we'll be using two data sets in this workshop the first one is the loan default data set hosted on um, Zindi by data science nigeria so the, the the goal is to predict if somebody is going to defect or default on a loan okay so as we look at that set later you see there are many features that you can use like the date loan was collected the time the amount um, then demographic about the person, like for example, the age of the person, the um, was the person referred. There are lots of features that we're going to look at that later. So you have to be able to process or process this particular data set so that you can be able to predict loan default. So that's the first data set we'll be using. Then the second one is also hosted on Zindi. If you don't know Zindi, Zindi is a it's a data science competition platform, it's just like Kaggle, where you can work on data science competitions for prizes and uh, most of the data sets are also available after the competition so you can use them to learn so but Zindi is specific to Africa as a whole while cargo is global so the second data set is hosted on is is called sending logistic data set uh, published by Sendi on Zindi as well so it's a logistic company and uh, the, the, the goal of, of this uh, data set is to be able to predict time of arrival Okay, so the time of arrival of a particular delivery. So they want to use it to optimize their logistic services. Okay, so that's the same logistic. So why the goal of this uh, class is not to build uh, models, we are just going to be walking through major feature engineering that you will be doing on this data set so you can actually prepare them for modeling. So let's move on. All right, so the first thing that we did here is to import our libraries important libraries, pandas, numpy, seaborn for plotting, matplotlib, we ignore warnings. Um, also there's this library I put here, datasyst. Datasyst is a library for doing quick data processing and prototyping. So why most of the things that we're doing here will be using pandas and numpy, I'll show you how to quickly do it using datasyst. Okay, so then uh, we import the data. So we have the loan the long data set comprises of three. So we have three separate data sets or three separate tables. So meaning you have to, if you are going to be modeling with this, you have to um, process them and merge them together, join them together, okay? So if you, I'm going to share these um, notebooks with you all so you can, the, the link to the data set is actually there. So if you click on it, you can go to that particular page and download the data sets from there, okay? So um, we read in the loan data sets, which comprises of the demographics of the person, of the people collecting the loan. We talk about the age, the um, uh, year of birth, 
Oh, I said age already. Okay, the year of death, the name of the person, the um, is the person a graduate or not? So these are just like demographic about the person collecting the loan. And we have previous loans that people have collected or all the all the uh, people have collected in the past. So can you understand? Can you use this previous loan, the status of this previous loan, to like predict if this person will actually default now? That's this second table. Then I also have trend performance performance of previous loan how well did they perform then uh, the next data set is the sending logistic data sets okay so I explained this one earlier so let's move on okay so taking a look at the head of the data sets for loan demographic we see that we have uh, let's see one two three four four five I think about nine features yeah we have about nine features so I think I'm going to remove the transpose Oh, sorry, I didn't import this. Um, I'm going to, yeah, don't do this. Okay, so you can see that clearly. All right, so we import this. Um, now let's look at our head. So we have customer ID, which is just a unique identifier for the customers. So this is a categorical feature. Okay. Then we have birth dates. So you can see, I think this this is a, like a time feature. Birth dates of the person. The account type of the person is it savings or is it current? What type of account is the person holding? Then the location. You can see we have latitude and longitude location. Then the name of the bank. So you can see we have GT Bank, Sterling Bank. So these are all banks in Nigeria. Okay. So then uh, we have bank bank branch clients. I think most of them are missing. Then we have employment status of the person. Is it permanent? I think we'll, we'll look at all the categories later. Then we have the level of education of the person. So this is the demographic of the data set. Then let's also look at the performance. Loan performance. Okay, so we also have a customer ID. So you can see we have customer ID here, we have customer ID here. So this is like a unique feature or the key, primary key that we can use to join these two data sets together. Okay, and we have loan ID. So this is a different type of key. Then we have loan number. Okay, then we have the date the loan was approved, the creation date, the amount that was collected, total due. So for example, this is like the interest on top of it. That's the interest total is like the interest plus the capital plus the principal that was borrowed. So you can see this is thirty thousand, and now it's now thirty four thousand five hundred. So we have an interest of four thousand five hundred. So this is what the person is supposed to pay back. And we have the ten days, the the, 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 the length or the days, the time that the person has to pay back. So this is thirty days, which is typically a month. This is fifteen days, which is two weeks, and the rest. Then referred by if the person was referred by any other person before, then this is a good or bad flag. This is what they are trying to predict. If the best, if the loan will be good or bad, so this is like the uh, target. This is the target for this particular loan default data set. So this is the target. Then the last one in the loan default is the loan previous. So looking at previous loans collected by a particular person, so you can see we also to have customer ID. Which is the unique ID that is common to the three data sets. So, if you are going to merge these data sets together, you will want to consider using the customer ID. Then we have a system loan ID, which is similar to what we have here. So, you can see that we can use this ID to join these data sets, previous loan and loan performance together. And you have loan number as well, approved date, creation date, loan amount, total due, 10 days. Let's see, quite similar. Okay. Then uh, referred by first due date, first repeated. So you can see there are different types of features in these data sets. Okay, you have numerical features, you have categorical features, you have date features, and the rest. So, for example, this this approved date creation, these are all date features. And if you are going to be building a machine learning model, you cannot work with date features like this. You have to extract the information from it and also do some pre-processing. 
Then, for example, uh, features like uh, you can see this one loan amount is in tens of thousands. I think then this is ten thousand, ten thousand is twenty thousand, and you can see loan number. You can see two nine eight five two. This is 30, 30, 30, 15, 15. So you can see these scales are very different. So for, for you to build good and robust, robust models, there should be a way for you to be able to put all numerical features in the same scales so that it can actually help your model learn faster and improve. And also, um, you can see this is the categorical features where you have savings, I think different type of bank accounts. You know, bank name clients also have different type. So these are all categorical features that you need to convert to numerical features before you can work on them or before you can do machine learning model. Also, you have features with missing values. So you can see we have none, none, none here, none, none here. So there has to be a way for you to be able to fill these missing values. If it's a categorical features, how do you fill the missing value? If it's a numerical features, how do you fill these missing values? So there are different ways that you can do that, and we are going to work on that. So we now have an idea of like what data set is all about. I think the last one is for Cindy. So let's look at Cindy and see what it was. Okay, this is a quite a large data set. You have 29 features. Alright. So you have order number, these are the order that was placed, user ID, the particular user, then the type of vehicle that was used. So this is bike, 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 bike. Then Platform type, I think it's like um, something peculiar to their platform. Then you have personal business, business personal, categorical feature, placement day, when it was the time it, the order was placed, the time the order was confirmed, the day, the month, the week. I think there are other features in between. If you want to see more, just use the transpose. Yeah. So, confirmation time, however, at pickup time month weekday time of the day so you can see these are all most of the features are time features and for you to build good models there you, sh you should be able to convert or extract the correct information from these time features okay so you also have distance temperature latitude pickup latitude destination latitude longitude rider id and time from pickup to arrival so this is the target this is what you are trying to predict okay so you have that. Um, so right now we've seen like the head of our data. We understand most of the features that we have here. Yeah. So I think we should move on to feature engineering and data processing on this particular data set. So but before that, I'm just going to uh, show you how you can use uh, data sets to quickly understand your data. So there's this module called struct data. So you pass in the data set that you want to describe. So for example, um, let me use, I'm going to use loan performance. So you have DS, remember we imported data set as DS, and uh, that's this, import data set as DS. Then uh, moving, I'm on my mouse, okay. Uh, yeah. So ds dot structure data as the name of the module dot describe you pass in the data set. So what this does is that it gives you like a summary, a high level summary of your data set, what it's all about. So you can see we have the first five data points, which is the head. This is what we did here manually. Okay. So it shows you that. Then it gives you a random five data points. So you can see somewhere around the middle if you want to look at just random points from inside. Then the last five data points as well. Okay, so this can help you understand better understand what you are working with, what kind of data you are working with. Then it also gives you the shape of the data sets. So you can see we have 4,368 rows and just 10 features. Gives you the size, then it gives you the data type. Okay, so you can see customer IDs and objects. Remember, pandas represent cat categorical features, string features as objects. Okay. So then loan ID is an integer, loan number is an integer, proof date. So a proof date is represented as objects, it's supposed to be date time, but we'll do that conversion later. All right, so we have that. Then um, columns, 
Okay, so so data is telling you that you have some date features that should be converted to date time format. So you can see we have creation date, approve date, and they should they, should, they were supposed to be in date time format. So you can use this particular function to convert them to pandas date time format. So we should we do later. And you also see your numerical features, these are numerical features, see your categorical features as well. Then there's also it also gives you a statistical description of the columns that you have. Okay, so you can see count, mean, division, the percentile or the quarter, then the maximum. So from here you can get a quick understanding of your numerical features and just try to understand them. It also describes your categorical features, so you can see customer ID, how many are they count. So you can see this referred by, it has just 587 values, the other ones are missing. So you know that you have to fill this particular feature. Then it also gives you the unique values, top, frequency and the rest. Okay. Then um, this is just the same thing as this, it's plotting the unique counts for you to give you an idea of the ones that have missing values. Then you also have a table for missing values. Now you see um, for all the features, there are no missing values except for the fed bar in this particular data set. So we have 3,781 features that are missing in this fed bar column. That's at 86% of the data. So there are many things that you can do with this information. You can either decide to feed this data set this particular feature or drop it but looking at the percentage it is 6.6 uh, there's a trade-off you can you can you can try filling it and see if it, it if it will be important to your model or you can try removing it sometimes uh, removing this particular feature can actually help your model while sometimes filling it will actually be better so there are lots of things that you can try so all right we have that now so you can see how you can use data sets to get a quick description of your data set. So we have that now. The next thing to look at is uh, how to handle missing values. Now most of the things that we do here, uh, like I point out here in this place, is not going to be following in our like, like a chronological order. You don't have to do this first. There are different things that you can do first. So this is just like to give you an overview of all the possibilities of, of things that you can actually do. Okay. So you don't have to start with filling, filling the missing values first. So please just note that. All right, so how do we fill missing values? So filling missing values uh, not recorded during data collection is important, okay? So there are many things that can cause missing values to happen in a data set. One, it can be left out due to errors. It can be that the data set is too difficult to measure, so you can't measure every instance and, and the rest. So but there are different ways that you can actually do this filling. And this feeling depends on the type of data that you're working with. So if you have categorical features with missing values, there are specific techniques you use for categorical features. Then if you have numerical features with missing values, there are also specific techniques that you can use. So starting with categorical features, there are, there's the mode feeling, that's feeling missing values with the most popular or the most frequent class. So for example, if I have a data set where I collected the gender of people, so you have so for example male and female, and say you have more female in data sets. Okay. So if I have a miss a particular missing instance in a data set, I can decide to fill it with a mode. And what would the mode be? The mode will be female. Why? Because I have more instances of female in data sets. So I'm indirectly assuming that. If I have a missing value, it's most likely to be female. Why? Because female is the modal class, or the most popular class. So that's one method of filling, which is the mode. Then you also have temporal filling, which is like time-based filling, where you have forward or backward feed. Where, for example, this is mostly important if you are working on with time series data, where you have, where you, for example, you want to fill the the next value based on the previous value. So you can decide to say, uh, for example, if I have, uh, let's say, a temperature recording. So for example, at 10 o'clock, I have, I recorded a temperature of, say, 36 degrees centigrade. Then at um, uh, 11 o'clock, I recorded 37 degrees centigrade. At 12 o'clock, I recorded 38. So you can see there's kind of like an increment in the, in the recorded temperature based on time. So if I have a missing value for, say, 1 o'clock, for example, I can use forward filling. 
to say okay if i have 36 37 38 the most the next feature is likely going to be close to 37 as well so you can do forward filling on that the same way you can if you reverse it you can also do backward filling where you feed data based on their predecessor okay so this is mostly done in uh, in time series data set data set where you have features that are depending on each other on either the pre the uh, preceding value or the succeeding value so that's for temporal filling then you also have encoding and filling in this case you can actually do encoding if you have uh, categorical features you can encode them with numbers then you can now maybe do some calculate the mean or the mode of it and use it to fill so these are for categorical features okay so let's just see that in action so what, what i did here is to like i want to use the mode filling for this particular data set for loan demographic let's look at the ones that have missing values so you can see we have this is any dot sum will show you the um, data points or the features with missing values so you can see for bank branch clients we have 42,000 no sorry 4,295 features or missing instances out of 4,346 which is very high okay for employment status we have 648 missing for level of education we have this missing so and these are all categorical features so bank branch is a categorical feature employment status the same thing level of education they are all categorical features okay so if you are going to fill fill it let's start with mode filling with mode okay let's see what i did here now for for employment status if you use this value count since it's a categorical feature you can get the most popular class which is the modal class so you can see that permanent is a modal class with 3146 instances okay and you have self-employed students unemployed retired and contract so if you are going to be filling with mode for this particular feature you are going to be using this permanent class why because it's the modal class it's more popular so we are assuming that if a missing value occurs in, in this particular feature it is most likely going to be permanent okay so you can so, so we'll do that so from the value count we see that permanent is a modal class so filling with mode is simple so what we just do is a uh, loan demographic dot fill na this is pandas function that says that okay i want to fill every missing value in employment status with this value permanent so to replace every any and none with permanent class okay so if you check that again now you can see employment status is gone so you can do the same for bank branch clients and uh, level of education of the client so you can do the same thing first of all check the um, modal class and then you can use the fill na function to, to do that okay then uh, for numerical features what are the kind of um, feeling that you can do you can feel with the mean or the mode or the median so for categorical features you cannot calculate the mean you cannot calculate the mean of categorical features so it must be numeric you cannot calculate the median of categorical features you can only you can only look for the mode but for numerical features you can calculate the mean you can calculate the mode or you can calculate the median so you can use these things to feel then you can also do a temporal feeling like we said earlier you can use the uh, use of machine learning models to fill, which I'm going to show you shortly. Meaning, you train machine learning model to learn the most appropriate value to use to fill missing values. This is also very important, and it works well most of the time. Okay, so now let's demonstrate how to fill some numerical features. So let's look at this time. Let's consider the sending logistic data sets. So remember, we saw that okay, using is any that sum shows us that. We have two features, which is temperature and precipitation in millimeters that have missing values. So this precipitation in millimeters is very high. We see 20,649 out of how many? Let's see. Let's look at the out of 21,201. So you can see it is very high number of missing values in this guy okay so we also have temperature so and these are numerical features right so how do we fill them now different methods so we can use mean 
So it's simply just calculating the mean of this particular feature. So send it data temperature dot mean, save it here. You can also get the mode using dot mode. And modes sometimes come, for example, if I do this, if I run the mode of this guy, I have to 24.7. So sometimes you might have, uh, so let me, okay, so if you calculate the mode in pandas, it normally returns two values, okay, like something like an index and the particular mode. Okay, so for you to get that particular modal value, you subset it using this list option here yeah. okay so please take note of that all right and sometimes you can have two modal values so you can decide to choose one you can have two values that are very popular that are the same so you can decide to choose one then you can also calculate the median the same way so using this calculated values the filling is easy just use the fill any function on the particular picture pass in the value that you want to use so you can see for temperature you fill any using the mean this is filling with mean okay so for mode the same thing for median the same thing so remember to use one at a time okay so if you are going to be filling with mean fill with mean and don't fill with mode so i'm just showing you how you can do that so but at a time you should use only one okay so you can see for mean it fill with 23 for temperature and for modal value it isn't 25 so, so this tells you that uh, 25 is the most common temperature value for this particular data set. Okay, so for mode fees 25, for medium value fees 24. So you can see that they are very close to each other. Now, what you can do is to compare if you are training a model, you cannot compare when you feed with mean the, the accuracy is the accuracy higher than when you feed with the modal value or when you feed with the medium value. So you can compare and then decide which particular value to use. Okay, so that's for filling numerical feature. Then also another way to fill, like we said earlier, is to train a machine learning model that can calculate the best filling value. Okay, because sometimes the, the the value of a particular feature will depend on other features. So you can you can actually use other features to predict what the particular value will be for this feature. So so in such a way, what you actually need to first of all do is to look at or look out for features that correlates or that helps to predict this particular feature that have missing values okay so one way to do that is to use this a seaborne heat map seaborne heat map shows the correlation between features in a graphical format okay so for example um this feature precipitation in millimeters that we saw that was missing here as well okay and this guy has lots of missing values okay so this time so let's fill this particular feature so, but first we have to look for features that correlate to this particular one in the data set so if we get those particular features we can now predict the filling values it's as if we are taking this perception in millimeter as a target and we are being a machine learning model to predict it i don't know if you got that so so for example how do we now get the um, features that are correlated with this particular feature we can use the seaborne heat map so we simply pass in uh, the data set which is this guy the correlation data set to an heat map function so now we have this so in this feature now you can look at uh, let's look for precipitation in millimeters now you can see it is not too correlated with many features that's why you have lots of dark dots so you can see dark 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 that's um, day of the month confirmation day and the rest Okay, but there are some few features where you have a little bit of correlation, just very low. So you can see we have, I think, longitude, latitude, time for pickup to arrive, mm, a little bit. So, so there are some few features that are actually correlated to this precipitation in millimeter, okay, that you can use. Now, also, if you notice um, distance, for example, Distance is highly correlated with time for pickup to arrive, which is our target. So distance is a very, very important feature in predicting time for pickup to arrive. So for instance, if distance has missing values, we could use these features like this, which is pickup longitude, destination longitude, and this particular feature to predict what those missing values will be 
because they are highly correlated. That's just the way um, filling with machine learning model works. Okay. So now that we have a, a few few features, I think about three or four that are correlated with perception in millimeter, we extract those features, which is this. So you can see attitude, longitude, time pick up to arrival, which is these three last features. Um, that's this guy. One, two, and three. Okay. So we extract those particular features from, from the data set. Okay? And we prepare a train and a test set. We're going to create a very simple model. So you can see we're creating a very simple linear regression model. Okay. So we extract the particular instances where this feature is not empty. So that will serve as our training set. Okay. So that's what we did here. So the particular instances where it is not empty, not null, those will be our training data. Okay. Our uh, white train the same thing remember precipitation in millimeters. Then for the testing, it is where it is actually empty. So this is what we want to predict. We want to predict for the particular areas where it is empty. Okay. So after creating this particular data set, we just train a simple linear regression model and then we predict on the test set. So this prediction on the test set is the values that have been used to fill. Okay. So we replace every missing value with the particular prediction. So you can see these are some samples of the values that we feel. So in, in a sense, what we're actually doing here is like training a very simple model that and we are taking this this feature that has missing values as kind of like a target. Okay. Whereby the, the, the particular instances that have missing values are what we want to predict. So for us to be able to predict this we have to look for features that are correlated to it. Okay. This is a method. So this works most of the time also. So you can also try it. It can actually sometimes can help to improve your model because you are learning the values that you use that you need to be able to fill these missing values. So that's also another method for numerical features. There are different methods as well. There's uh, imputers, like for example, SKLN has imputer too. So there's a, a popular one is called iterative imputer. The iterative imputer has like it does exactly what we did here, okay, but in a more um, easier format, okay. So all you do is just to import it from iterative imputer, telling the model you want to use. So in this case, we're using a random forest model. So you can see this is what we did here. Then the data set, the uh, particular correlated features to the data, which is temperature, latitude, longitude. Time of pick up to arrive at. Okay, so in this part, what I did, I have since we've already filled this, I was trying to use temperature to also show you how you can do that. So, in this way, what you do is the data set this is this guy, then you pass in um, the particular features, which is one, two, and three as a training feature, then the column, which is uh, this guy here, as that. Then you fit transform it. So, what it's going to do is going to take each calculated values from these particular features is going to use it to transform this particular data set and fill it. So it's basically doing similar thing to what we did here, but it's actually quite easier to use. So it depends on you, you can decide to use any of these. So these are the values that it used to fill the data set. Okay. So instead of using one value, one single value like main or the mode or the median, it's basically going to use different values based on what it has calculated using these features. This is what we have. So that's for numerical features. Then um, we've talked about um, filling of categorical features, talked about filling of numerical features. Now we'll move on to the next segment, which is how to handle categorical features. Okay. So for you to handle categorical features, you have to understand that we have different types of categorical features because we have uh, basically ordinary categorical features, which is this guy, and non ordinary categorical features. So, what are they? So, ordinary categorical features from the name ordinary has a particular uh, ordered categories. So, for example, we have a particular class or a particular category that has a higher order than another class. So, for example, if you have uh, star ratings in an application where you have one, two, three, four, five stars, if somebody gives two stars, 
it is higher than when somebody gives one star. And if somebody gives a five star, it's higher than when somebody gives any of these four, three, two, or one star. So this is a categorical feature. Why? Because you have just five classes, one to five. But these classes have order, meaning a particular class can be higher than another class. This is called an ordinary categorical feature. So if you are going to be encoding such features, for example, they, you have to consider the, the ordering. Okay. So if, if for example, we have uh, um, secondary, graduate, postgraduate, and primary in the loan, loan demographic data sets, this is like the uh, level of education of people. Okay. So for this level of education, it is it, it is we know that postgraduate is higher than graduate, and graduate sorry about that. And um, graduate is higher than secondary, and secondary is higher than primary. So there is an order to this particular level of education. So if you are going to be encoding this feature, you have to consider this ordering. So for example, I might decide to give postgraduate four, this guy three. Um, secondary two and then primary one when I'm encoding my features so that the, your machine learning model will consider this particular encoding or this particular ordering when it is making predictions or learning the underlying classes behind it. Okay, so that's ordinary categorical features. Then you have non ordinary categorical features, which is just like the opposite. So there are no particular ordering, all classes have the same level. So, for example, food. Well, food have different categories, but they are all the same. There's no food that is higher than another food, or something like that, or none that none that I've seen. <laughs> okay, so that's for mem category, non ordinary categorical features. So for you to be able to encode these features, you need to understand what type of category they fall in. Are they ordinary or are they non ordinary? Okay. So once you answer that question, you now know which type of encoding scheme to choose. Now there are different types of encoding scheme. There are very many. Okay, so we're going to consider some popular ones, and they are also important. So manual encoding of ordinary features. Now, if you have ordinary features, you can and the classes are not much. If the classes are not much, you can manually assign labels to each of them. So, for example, like uh, these uh, graduate classes or this level of education, we have just four categories. So we can manually assign a particular class or a particular number to each of these categories okay so that's manual encoding all right so you can basically use the map function in pandas so if you look at level of education remember we saw this before we have none which is missing which you can actually fill with um, the mode you can fill that with the mode and you have secondary graduate postgraduate primary so we can map numbers to each of these classes based on their based on our perceived um, ordering. So for postgraduates, try to give it a four, graduate three, secondary two, and primary one. Then we can map this, so you can use the map function in pandas to so this particular. So we've actually manually encoded this particular feature. So it is no longer a categorical format, it's not in numerical format, but we considered the ordinality. So that's manual encoding. So this is possible because we have just a few number of features. Okay, so if you have a larger number of features, there are other methods that you can actually use. All right, then um, moving on to the next, you can also perf perform automated encoding using a library called Categorical Encoders. Okay, so it's a very efficient library that contains numerous encoding schemes out of the box. So to install it, you just do pip install Categorical Encoders. There are lots of methods contained in this particular library. Alright, so if you install this, you can move on to label encoding. Label encoding simply assigns a unique value or a unique integer to a particular class. Now, it is not, um, the origin does not matter in label encoding. So it does not consider the origin of your classes. If you want to consider origin, you can use other encoding schemes or you can use manual encoding. But for label encoding, it just takes your classes and it assigns a unique integer to each of them. So it is useful when you have a large number of classes in your categorical feature and there is no order, there is no ordinality. So label encoding can be used for them. So, so all right, so how do we do that? So we can use um let's use this loan demographics, okay? All right, so 
we select all the categorical features so you can use this select d types include objects columns into this categorical columns so i think that's when we have a customer id birth date bank account type bank name bank branch client employment status so remember this is a date time feature but pandas represent this as objects okay so now we want to look at the number of classes in each of this category so you can use a unique function to do that so for this for each of the columns in this cat columns print as the unique number of unique classes that you have so for customer id you can see that we have 4334 that's a very large number of unique classes customer id then for uh birth date for birth dates we also have a large number of unique features for bank account type you have just three so you can see it's small for bank name client, which is the, the name of the banks, you have 18, not too large. Bank branch client, you have 55, mm, kind of somewhere in the middle. Then the employment status, you have just six. Okay, so depending on the number of classes, you can use different encoding scheme for this. All right, so now let's now the ordinary encoder. In uh, remember, I told you about categorical encoders, which you've installed here. Okay, so we're going to use a particular encoding scheme called ordinary encoder this ordinary encoder in categorical encoder is the same thing is similar to label encoding okay so take note of that All right so we're going to be encoding a bank name client which is uh let's see bank name client 18 and bank branch client which is 45 which has 45 features so we're going to be using the label encoding for these two features okay Alright, so how do you use that? So you just uh, create an object which is import categorical encoders CE, CE dot cat ordinary encoders, the particular column which is this one that we selected. These are the two columns that we want to ordinary encode. Then uh, we fit transform it. So you can see it is using the same API as SKLN. So you have fit, fit transform, and other stuff like that. So looking at it, um, after running this, let's look at it. Bank branch clients, maybe I should not transpose. Okay. Um, bank, oh, sorry, I've not done this code. Ah, install. I'm not connected to the internet. Yeah. So let me quickly, let me quickly install this package. supposed to run this particular segment okay so while we wait for that so quickly install and then install now you can see currently we have this is the bank name client and the bank branch client so we have they are still in categorical format okay this is this one as well but um, we can't see let's let me, let me look at it see oh this guy is mine okay perfect yeah so let's look at it here so now you can see for bank name clients you now have numbers instead of um the categories and for bank branch client you also have numbers so it has assigned a unique integer to each of those particular categories so out of the box you can see that it's very quick and very easy to do that all right so that's for labor encoding so remember you use labor encoding when you have um um lots a categorical feature with lots of classes and there are no ordinality so that's when you can use label encoding all right so what about if you have uh ordinality for example and the classes are not too much so in that case you can use something called the one not encoding so one not encoding uses binary values to represent the presence and absence of a particular class for example so if you have lots of features in a particular category so if you have lots of classes in a particular feature it is not advisable to use one of the encoding why because one of the encoding quickly becomes um, much or quickly grows by the number of categories that you have okay so because it's going to be creating a feature per category so if you have 35 classes for example in this case where we have um, 3220 3297 feature or this guy 
where we have this. If you are going to be using one of the encoding to encode this particular categorical feature, it's going to generate 4,334 extra features to your data set, and that is very many. Okay, so in like in this case, it's going to add an extra 18 features to your data set. But for labor encoding, you can see that it was, it was just the same one feature. So one of the encoding is, is, is good, it's important when you have an ordinality in your data set, in your feature, and the classes are not much. So for example, in um, yeah, like in employment status of clients where you have just six classes, and in bank account type where you have just three classes, you can use one of the encoding. Okay? So let's quickly see how we can use that. So also we have the one-note encoder in the categorical encoders library. So you just call it one of the encoder, the same method, passing the particular features that you want to one of the encode, then you do a fit transform. So if I run this and then let's look at the head of the data set. So you can see bank account type and level of education bank account type now remember we have three classes those three classes now we have extra three features okay so it has created one feature for each class that's for the bank account type then we also have for the bank name clients which had no nope, that was not bank name clients okay so level of education where we have one two three i think it should be about six is it five let's look at it okay yes we have six six unique classes so it created extra six features which is one two three four five oh so the first the uh is going to create five six minus one five features yeah all right so that's for one not one not including so then also there are actually there are numerous uh, values there are, there are numerous schemes that you can use in categorical encoders there's also another one called the hash encoding so hash encoding is fast and space efficient so if you have a large number of classes and you don't want to use one of the encoding or you don't want to use label encoding you can use the hash encoding so hash encoding is very very efficient so the same it works using the same method so you create an object then you create something called the component. So the component is like the, the, the dimension, how many, the, the more dimension you give it, the more it will be able to effectively capture the particular class that you have. So you can set to use 10, if you are working with a large, a, a, class, a data set or a feature that has a large number of class, you can set to use a, at least a little bit higher number of components. So this is how you use it. All right, so you can see, let's, let's let me use that one demographic so for this particular feature bank name clients and bank branch clients I'm going to take some time because we have about 10 components all right so now you can see it added column 0 to column 9 so it added 10 extra components that it has encoded using these particular features okay so that's for hash encoding so you can see there are numerous ways, numerous methods. There's also another one called target encoding. In this target encoding, you, you use the, the 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 idea of the target. So for example, if you are trying to predict, like in this data set, we're trying to predict a uh, good or bad flag. So that means we're trying to predict if a loan will be defaulted or not. So you can use this uh, particular target to fill, use the idea or the knowledge embedded in this particular target to encode a particular feature so it's called target encoding it mostly works but sometimes it can cause severe overfitting so you just have to try it and see if it works for you so how do you do that the same method using categorical encoders so you can see most of all the encoding schemes are already implemented in categorical encoders so you just have to just create an object and call it to use it okay so that's what we did here so for example this particular loan number you can use the target encoder so we specify the target which is this and we specify the data set plus just the here. and we have something like this loan number so you can see we have something like this all right so let's move on to that so if you need to know understand more um encoding schemes 
you can look at the official documentation so this notebook will be there so you can go to the official documentation of category encoders and you can actually uh, work on this so let's move on to the next part which is how to handle numerical or continuous features so how to handle uh, numerical slash continuous features all right so we've talked about um filling numerical features filling categorical features and we also talked about how to handle categorical features such as encoding and the rest so what about numerical features are there some things that we can do to numerical features yes there are okay so uh what can we do now there are uh, there's anybody told you that sometimes your numerical features can might have different scales okay so you can do something called standardization and you bring all your data set or all your numerical features to the same particular scale so that helps in modern learning it helps uh, to speed up your model training and it also helps models that are distance based because there are most models that actually distance based so if you have features that are in the same scale it can help them to perform better okay so there are also other things that you can do so i think the first one here is log transformation so sometimes you have data sets or you have features that are skewed so for example looking at this uh, distance data set in the sending logistic data you can see it is, it is actually skewed to the to the left okay so this kind of data sets can uh, you can actually use something called log transformation to center the data sets because most machine learning models make this assumption that your data is uh, normally distributed or uniformly distributed okay so to, to help the models perform better you can actually just use a log transformation to um, transform your data features so that they become kind of balanced at the center okay so much like everything in data science this sometimes helps to improve your model sometimes it does not so you just have to try it and see if it actually works for you okay so log transformation helps to, helps to um, center your data helps to center or in statistical term normally distribute your data it can help most machine learning models perform better so for this particular feature which is distance in sending data when we plot it you can see it's step skewed so if you use there's this log 1p in uh, numpy so you can use mp.log1p so what does the meaning of this log 1p it's it, it actually sometimes you, you cannot take the log of zero okay if you take the log of zero if your data set of your feature has a particular instance where the value is zero and you try to take the log within it's going to give you an error so log 1p actually adds one to it so it adds one to each feature before it takes the log, log transformation of it okay so you can see after log transforming data the data is now a little bit centered almost like a uniformly distributed data do not perfect but a little bit better than this which was actually left skewed so you can use plotting to check your data set and see which particular features are skewed either left or right and you can actually just log transform it using methods like this okay so also you can also use domain knowledge to work on your number on your features so you can uh, understand the features better for example logistic features what kind of type of, what are the type of um, features that we can derive from this particular transportation data and the rest or if it's a financial data set what kind of type of features that we can create from it so you can use domain knowledge so for example in the um, loan data we can create a new feature called interest so interest is the difference as interest elapsed which is the difference between the total due and the loan amount that was collected so you want to know how much has been added to it so maybe that might determine if somebody will actually default on a loan or not so we don't know yet but it might help so how do we do that you just simply calculate the difference between the total due that was collected sorry the total amount that was collected and the total due so that can give us a new feature called interest elapsed so you can see we're using our knowledge of the fact that we can know the uh, interest that has entered a particular capital or a particular uh, principal that was collected by subtracting it from the total due. So, if you study your data set very well, there are lots of features that you can come up with, something like this. So, there are lots of things that you can do. So, also, you can also calculate the loan count. 
you can calculate the total number of loans that was collected by a customer by aggregating the loan number across all the data points so because sometimes you can have a person collect collect more than one loan so the person has collected maybe like 20 loans in the past and if the person has collected like 20 loans in the past and he has successfully paid all of them that can be a good indication that if we give this person a loan now the person would actually be able to pay back so this can be an important feature the number of loans the person has collected which is actually called the loan count so we can do that using a group buy on the customer id and we aggregate the counts and the loan number so that's what we did here getting this count will now merge back on the particular loan data set so if you look at it um loan number count so you can see this person has collected 11. now don't mistake this loan number count with this loan number so from the description of the data set i think this loan number is just a unique number given to each of the loan that was collected unique integer so but this loan number count is a number of loans this particular user which is this person has taken in the past so you can see this person has taken 11 loans this one has taken 11 as well i think they are the same person okay they are different all right then uh this one is six this one is two so this could also be an important feature then looking at the sending logistic data set we can calculate speed using knowledge of physics we know that speed is distance per unit of time and in our data set we have distance and we have arrival time so we can use it to calculate the speed of the person so and the speed can actually help help us in calculating the time of arrival because if we know the speed we can estimate how long the person will take to arrive at a particular place so you can see speed using our domain knowledge of physics we can actually create this feature called speed so you can see distance divided by time will give us the speed and from there you can see let's go to the last part yeah speed so you can see this is the speed of this rider this is the speed of this rider so this feature can also help us in now uh, improving our model so there are lots of other things that you can actually do as well so i'll leave that to you to try and uh, so i will be fast here and not spend too much time now, the next thing i also want to talk about is polynomial features now one of the important things about machine learning models is is is, the, is something called their, their capacity okay because the more capacity you give a model um, the more freedom you give a model the more features you give to it the more it will be able to actually estimate or predict a particular target all right so if for example you have a data set that has just five six features it might not be enough those the number of features might not be enough to to, to really capture the um information inherent in the data set so so what can you do to improve this you can actually do what is called crossing feature crossing or generating of new features from this particular uh little number of features that you have okay so that's where polynomial features comes in place i think this is one of the reasons why uh, deep learning models are actually very efficient because deep learning models can extract quite a number of features from little data sets okay and they can use it to um create better models although um, the downside of polynomial features is that it can actually lead to massive overfitting so you have to be careful when using it so it is better if you try different number of polynomial features so that you don't actually go into overfitting so polynomial features can be created there's this um, uh, module in sklearn preprocessing module so you can import the polynomial features from there and what do you do you just select a particular features that you want to cross or that you want to create polynomial features on so for example loan number total due and term days which are three features i want to cross these particular features together and create new features from it so crossing can be addition can simply multiplying them together or dividing them together so these are all features that i can create from these three features here so remember the same api if it's transformed passing the data sets and the features that you want to cross okay so then uh do a fit transform here all right so now you can actually specify the number of dimensions that you want to use do you want to use uh, a polynomial feature of degree two or degree three or degree four so the feature will tell you how many times these features are going to be crossed with each other 
So it's, it's advisable to keep it simple, but you can try different methods. Methods there. All right. So um, if you cross these particular features and print the edge, so let's move on. So you can see it's adding zero to nine. We add one, two, three, three features, three by three, nine. So it's going to add extra nine features to the data set, which is the a crossing of each of these particular features. So that's polynomial features for you. So if you have a data set that has little number of features, you can try crossing them together and seeing if it will help improve your models. And note, you can only cross um, numerical features. So if you want to cross the categorical feature, you can maybe decide to encode it. I doubt if that might work well. Work well. So, but it is advisable to cross numerical features and to cross features that you think or that you know are correlated to each other. Okay. So don't start crossing features that are not correlated to each other. It might worsen your model performance. All right. So let's quickly move to the next one, which is normalization of features. You can also call it standardization. Okay. So normalization of feature helps to change your numerical value to a common scale without distorting the difference in the range of values or losing information. It is very important for distance-based models like KNNs, neural networks, and the rest. Okay. Although it is in some models which, like tree models which are not um, uh, are not affected by distance, you can actually work with them like that. But for most models, it is advisable to scale your data or to normalize your data. There are many types of normalization strategy. The standard scalar, which standardizes the feature by removing the mean and scaling to unique variance. There's robust scalar, there's mean mass scalar, they are very different. So it depends on what you want to do. So and also a note here you should not fit your you should never scale your you should never fit your um, test of validation data set. Okay, so you should calculate the scaling values or the normalization values on your train data set alone and then use these values on your test data set. Why? Because this can cause leakages. So take note of that. So how do we use this? You can just import it from the preprocessing module. So you can see standard scalar. Then you use the fit transform, the same API as always. Specify the particular features that you want to transform. Okay, so remember now I'm transforming just these three features. So you can decide to transform all your numerical features, but it won't work on categorical features. You cannot transform categorical features. So remember to always encode your categorical features before you transform them. Okay, so fit transform does so you can see. The values are now small and, are, and they are now in the same range. If you notice earlier, your low number was kind of a little small, the range was not high, but the total due was in tens of thousands. So you can now see they are all now in the same range of between zero and one. So this will help model perform better. Also, there's your boss scalar as well. There's the mean mass scalar. Here you can specify the minimal range that you want to use. So I might decide to say, okay, I want to I want to compress or I want to normalize all my values between zero and two. So you can see to to give you values between that particular range. So that's why it's called the mean and maximum scalar. So it follows the same method: create an object from it, then fit transform it. All right. So uh, I think uh, we're almost close to the end now. But I would also like to talk about how to work with date time features because most of the time you have features that are at a, um, um, you have features that have date time in them, okay? So you might want you can't use these features as they are. You can't say you can't pass in a date time feature like like Monday or this of the week or month in a year to a particular machine learning model and expect it to work work well like that. No, you have to like extract information from these date time features, convert them to numbers as well. Okay, so date time features are very popular in machine learning. So these features are temporal in nature and they require specific feature extraction techniques. So some of them are that you can extract date components like day of the week, day of the year, hour, month, seconds, quarter, day of the month, etc. So the thing is that for um, some data sets, you might, you might be surprised that knowing the um, day of the month can actually help your model perform better. So for example, if like in the loan loan data sets, you might be surprised that uh, if a person takes loan at the beginning of the month, they might be able to pay 
back faster than somebody that takes loan at the end of the month. It might just be that case. So you can see that these components are going to be very important in each of your model. So you have to be able to extract them from your dates or time features. Also, you can also extract time-based features like for evenings, noons, night time, stuff like that. Okay. So, like an example is for the semi logistic data sets where you are trying to calculate time of arrival. If the person, um, if the delivery guy or the delivery person decide to embark on the journey during evenings, maybe maybe during evenings there are more traffic, so it might take a longer time to get to destination than somebody that lives maybe during noon. So you can see that getting this type of time-based features from the date time feature can actually help better your model. Then you can also extract seasonal features like raining season, dry season, and a time period, winter, summer, autumn, and the rest. Then place specific features like holidays, religious breaks, festive periods. You can get all this from time. Also calculate time elapsed between two related time. So you can calculate the difference between maybe arrival time, order confirmation time, and things like that. These are all things that you can do with date time feature. So just, we're going to just I'm going to just show you some few. So for the first one is time elapsed. So time elapsed is like the difference between two time. So for example. Uh, the time the time alone was approved which is this approval date and the time alone was created okay so this might actually be a good feature so how do we do that so the first thing is to actually convert these features remember pandas always represent non-numerical features as objects okay so the first thing to do is to convert these features to pandas date time so once you convert them to pandas date time you can now use most of the features or most of the functions available to pandas date time objects meaning you can extract the day you can extract the, 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 the uh, month you can extract the year and things like that so the first thing to do is to convert to a date time so you can use a speedy pandas dot to date time pass in the particular feature and make sure to assign it back okay so then um Time allows simply now be the difference between approval dates and loan creation date. So you can see you can now subtract these two time features using this the, the minus sign because you have already converted them to date time feature. Okay, so doing that, then you can now divide by time data to get hour, the minute, and the seconds. So in this case, I want I want to get the seconds. So that was why I selected S here. So if I want to get the time difference in say hours, for example, you will place this place with H. If I want to get the time difference in minutes, you place this with M. So I decided to go for seconds. Alright. So now let's look at the calculation done. So you can see date time elapsed. You have three thousand six hundred and nine seconds between when the loan was approved was created and when the loan was approved. So you, you might be surprised that this might help your model perform better because uh, maybe when the loan was created, it had to go through lots and lots and lots of uh, review before it was finally approved. It may be um, when the loan was created, the person was a, was a, maybe it's a very good customer and the person normally pays back so the approval rate will be very fast. So this can actually help might help your model perform better so that's the time elapsed then uh, extracting features like day week hour and seconds is easy once you convert to date time so for example this approval date that converted to date time if you want to get the day you can just do this dot dt day get the day get the week get the hour you can also get the minutes and things like that okay so just extract the day and pass it through date okay so that's for that then um, there are many other things that you can also do from for the date time features so you can check them here and I, I also like to mention that most of these uh, functions are already implemented in data assist so you can just quickly use a single line of code to just extract all the dates that you need for example there's this module called time series dot so you can see describe date there's the extract date there's the extract time so for extract dates you can just 
see extract date information in data frame and append to the original data so you can pass in the data sets then the columns the date columns that you want to extract so it automatically extracts day of the week day of the year day of the month hour minutes whether it's weekend or not the year quarter to automatically extract it for you and return data frame for you so instead of doing all this dt the day dt the hour and the rest just this one line of code can do that for you if you want to if you want to learn more about it just go to documentation i will put the link below and you can see how to do that all right so you can also get period of the day like i said morning afternoon evenings and the rest so you have morning you have afternoon you have evening so depending on the time or the hour of the day okay so you can do that and using the same method you can also get festivity periods and um, holidays and the rest like that so there are lots of things that you can do so i'll leave you to try most of them then uh, i think the last one i would consider for today is uh working with latitude and longitudes okay so for places places can actually affect your model model because um knowing the place of a person can actually give you an idea of how the person behaves okay so geo-based features like latitude and longitude are very very important they contain records about the geography of a location or the geography of a place or a point okay so there are many ways that you can actually work with latitude and longitude okay so for example if you are given raw numbers of lats and longs you can convert it you can use um, packages to convert those numbers to a name of a particular place okay so but most of the time these methods do not scale why because if i have a, a, a data set that has say a hundred thousand rows for example so meaning i have a hundred thousand latitudes and longitudes if i'm going to use a package to convert each of these latitudes and longitudes to a particular name of a place it's going to cost me much why because I'm going to have to take time. The package has to run over a hundred thousand points and make a call to an API or something to, to get to retrieve these particular places. It's going to take time and most of the time it's going to be expensive. Okay, so there are numerous libraries like GeoJSON, GeoPy that you can use to convert these numerical values to physical addresses on the map. But these methods are sometimes slow and do not scale to large number of features. So, so there are other things that you can actually do to bypass doing this. So there are other things that you can do from latitude and longitude. And there's this efficient and amazing notebook or kernel on cargo by Beluga that shows some amazing techniques which I have started to show you here. Okay. So like the first one there is Manhattan distance. Okay. So the Manhattan distance is simply the, 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 the horizontal and vertical distance between two points. So it's like a straight line distance between two points. So if I know the latitude and longitude of the starting point and I know the latitude and longitude of the end point, I can get the distance between these two places. And that's like the straight line distance. Remember, distance in the data set, for example, like in semi logistic, the distance covered has to do with the road and the routes passed. But the minority distance has to do with the straight line distance as the crow flies between two places. So this kind of feature can actually help can actually also help in a, a model okay so this you can see this is the formula for calculating the Manhattan distance so it takes the latitude and longitude of the beginning point and the latitude and longitude of the end point and it calculates the Manhattan distance between these two places so we can write a simple function like this and then use it on the pickup latitude and destination latitude and longitude so we'll now calculate the distance between these two places which can also help okay so i know writing these functions every time you want to do this can take time so these are have all been implemented in data sets as well so you can use them easily so there's the feature engineering module and uh, yeah so you can see you have my hunting distance so you just need to pass in this latitude and longitude and to do the calculation for you Okay, but this is the code behind the scene. So that's for my acting distance. So you can see applied to the data set, you have these are the distances that you have. So this is an extra feature that your model can actually leverage to perform better. Then you also have something called the advancing distance. So this is the great circle distance between two points. For those that understand geography a lot, 
they understand the meaning of this advanced distance but you don't really need to understand the, most of the concepts behind these things but you can just try them and most of the time they really work so this is important in navigation so if you have logistic based data sets just like the sending logistics that we have you can decide to try this uh, feature engineering trick calculating the advanced sign distance okay so this is also like the code behind it also kind of lengthy and it is also implemented in data assist so you can use it and easily out of the bus so how do you use it you just pass in the latitude and longitude of the beginning point and the latitude and longitude of the end point and you can calculate that for you so you can see we now have an extra have assigned distance here the, there's also another one called the bearing so the bearing is the compass direction to travel from a starting point and it is in degree okay so in the bearing of a place all right so this is also like the formula for doing that it's kind of lengthy the same thing but easy to use and it's also implemented in data system you can use that so they are all in the feature engineering module i think bearing yeah so you can see yeah so latitude longitude calculates the bearing of the place the rest so you can all use this. I'm going to link the documentation, status assist, and also a sample tutorial that you can use to better understand how these things work. But know that you can actually do the calculation yourself as well as using existing tools. So that's for the bearing, calculated bearing, and we also have yeah, this. So you can see we have the bearing, we have the advancing distance, we have the marketing distance, all from the pick up latitude and longitude points that we have there's also another one called the get center point where you can get the center point between two locations from their latitude and their longitude so this can also help as well so this one is actually quite simple you just uh, add the latitude and longitude together for the pick up and destination or for the starting point and the end point and you divide by two okay so that will give you like the center latitude or the center longitude this could also help so meaning after doing all this you can try it on your model and see if it actually improves your model results or your model predictive power okay so that's basically some like um practical tips or some beginner guides to doing feature engineering and data processing is not all does not cover advanced steps there are many 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 other things that you can do but this can actually just set you on the right course and the right path to doing feature engineering. So basically, a wrap up, we started with how to fill missing values, then we moved on to working with numerical features, how to work with categorical features, encoding your data, and stuff like that. Then we move on to, um, um, what do we do again? Okay. okay, working with time features, then working with distance based features. I also mentioned, briefly mentioned data assist that you can use to do most of all this pre-processing that we've done here. So you can, the link is also in this notebook. So you can actually just check it out. We have implemented many of the functions that you'll be using. So even for filling missing values, there are easy way that you can use to fill missing values at data scale. So you can check that out. Yeah, and also you can learn more about it here. So we'll, we'll end here today, and uh, by ending, I would just like to mention this feature engineering is important, and there's a difference between a good machine learning model and the best machine learning model. So it can actually help to improve your model accuracy, your prediction rate a lot. So it is important that you take your time to pre-process your data, to engineer your data, to extract features, and stuff like that. So I'll be sharing this notebook with you all and you can improve it, you can add more features to it and you can use it to learn as you go. Okay. So uh so thank you very much for being part of this class and uh, you can connect with me on Twitter, the link is here. Connect with me on LinkedIn. If you have questions you can always drop in the comment section below for answer or you can send me a message on Twitter, LinkedIn and I would love to answer your questions and Thank you. So, thank you very much and uh, have a great day. Have a great time. 
And also, um, I would like to quickly thank the organizers of this Protocol School of AI, and uh, especially Steven, the lead there, and also the great people at Protocol School of AI, the great work that you guys are doing. So thank you very much for having me, and uh, keep doing what you do. Thanks.